Everyone, uh, please grab a seat and we'll start shortly. Good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome to the St. Basil's R. Tarman, 9.30am service. I'm Jonathan, and I'm glad you can join us, whether in person or online this morning. This week, we're continuing our series on the book of Ephesians, looking at chapter 2, verses 11 to 22. Last week, we looked at verses 1 to 10, which explain how we are saved by God's grace, not works. The correct response to this is to undertake good works that God has prepared in advance for us. Today we look at how Jesus has brought us together as one family under God. In our service today, we'll sing a song together, read the Bible and hear a sermon from David, read together a confession of our sins, have a time of corporate prayer, sing a second song together, and then finish with announcements. As we start our time together today, please join with me in prayer. And I'll be uh, also including a short prayer at this point um, as we uh, remember Anzac Day. So please join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for creating us and this world that we live in. We give you glory for all that you have done and all that you have promised to do. We ask that you would help us in our time together today, that we will honour you and learn how to better follow you. Uh, Father, we thank you for those who have served uh, overseas in the various wars, uh, providing protection and safety to us, often sacrificing their lives and uh, taking mental and physical injury for our safety. Uh, Father, we, we pray that uh, as you desire peace for all of us, that those in charge of our countries uh, would find ways to get along peacefully with each other and that the peace that we have here in Australia would be something that all countries throughout the world would enjoy. And we ask these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Angie will now lead us in a song. Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see you all here today, whether in person or online. Please stand as we begin our service in praise to our God.
Please take a seat. Uh, we'll now read the Bible together, so please turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, following the reading, David will bring us his talk today on this passage. Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 11 through to verse 22. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizen with God's people and members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Good, good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. Uh, everybody today. My name is David. I'm a minister here. Uh, it's great that you can join us uh, as we look at this part of the Bible together. Uh, let me pray before we look at Ephesians 2 together as a church. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and kindness to us. We thank you for your word which speak uh, every day. Help us to have a heart to listen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, does you know the Great Wall of China is one of those marvels in the world? Uh, as you research the history, the Great Wall is actually built not just one, one instance, but it was built many times over centuries uh, in, with different dynasties in China. Uh, in terms of length, it was about 20,000 kilometers and tried to tra traverse some of the most rugged terrain. Uh, so we're thinking about 20,000 kilometers, it's a bit like the whole east coast of Australia. You know, you know just imagine building a wall from Melbourne all the way to Cairns and all, all the way up to this Cape of Cap Cap Capricorn. Uh, according to legend, uh, it was the only man-made object that can be seen from the moon, uh, even though recently it has been debunked. Uh, it was one of the most amazing engineering feat in the world, but for many Chinese, well, many lives were lost in the construction. I think the idea of the Great Wall is this. It is so long that there's no way you can go around it. It's so high you can't go over it. And the purpose of the Great Wall of China is to keep out the barbarian tribes from the north. Because we know the barbarian tribes from the north are not civilized. They just came down to China proper to loot and to kill. The Great Wall of China is sort of symbolic to separate the uncivilized world from the civilized world. It was, wall, it was a wall designed to keep out and to separate. That was at that time, I suspect, China's policy of border security. See, we built walls to keep people out. We, keep, we built barriers to separate people. While it's good when you're inside, it's dreadful when you're outside because you're excluded. You do not belong. You're not wanted. 
the Jewish temple in Old Testament, well, it was designed to separate. In the temple itself, there are different walls and different sections, like, almost like concentric circles to separate people. There are few degrees of division. On the outside called the called court of Gentiles, there's a place where anyone can enter in. But past the outside court, well, there's an inside court in which only Israelites can enter in. That's the court of the women. Only Jewish men and women can enter in. After that wall, well, you go to the next wall in which only Jewish men who are ritually clean can enter in. You may thus far, you're probably quite proud of yourself, but there's a few other walls. So after the Jewish, uh, the inside court, you can go into another court, which only the priest can enter in. But after that, you go to another wall, which is called Holy of Holies, in which the, the, only the high priest, only once a year, only on the day of atonement, that he can enter in. See, the Jewish temple was designed with different walls and different barriers that are there to divide and to separate. And it's a constant reminder as you walk in that you do not belong. Last week, we read that the Gentiles were dead in their sins, and God in His kindness brought them alive. It was what we call the rags to riches story. The emphasis this week is not about rags to riches, but the emphasis this week is about how we, the Gentiles who are far away, separated, has now been brought near. The division pe between people has been removed. Walls have been removed. Last week, the emphasis was on the resurrection. This week, the story was on reconciliation. Firstly, in this chapter... Paul reminded them the former status of the Gentiles. Gentiles just means non-Jews, most of us. The status of Gentiles was that they were separated from Christ. The Christ word just means the Messiah, the anointed king. There is immense privilege for being associated with God's king. He's the one who will save his people, and he's the one who will rule the world. And the Gentiles have no part in that. Furthermore, we're told they're excluded from the citizenship of Israel. Israel was a chosen people of God with all the privileges and all the rights. The Gentiles, well, they're separated from the people of God. They were outsiders. They do not belong. Moreover, they were aliens to the covenant promise. God made incredible promises to the people of Israel. The promises included the sacrificial system, the law of God, the promise of blessing. The people of God could be forgiven of their sins. They have the knowledge of God. The Gentiles were aliens to those promises. And the disadvantages heap up to a tragic climax. We were told they were without hope and without God in this world. Many people in this world like to think they have a hope. The tragic reality is there is no hope. Death awaits us. Death comes to the king and the commoner. It comes to the rich and the poor. It comes to the wise and the fool. There is no hope. Furthermore, there's no God. While the Gentiles had a false God, well, they have no access to the one true God. Their prayers are not heard. They have no word from God. They have no guidance for their lives. When they're suffering, they've got no one to appeal to. When they pray, no one listens. Such was the state of the Gentiles. They are without hope and without God in this world. Many refugees we know are what we call considered what we call stateless. They escape from the country of origin many times because of persecution or because of war. They they escape with their like shirt in their back, literally, 
and they travel to any country, they will let them in. Sometimes even when a country will not let them in. And when land to the country, well, they have, because they're refugees, they have no protection from the law of the land. They cannot work or settle in a country. Most countries do not want them. They cannot come near. So most places just sort of huddle them, send them aside in what we call refugee camps. And they could be easily deported at any time. They have no safety, no security. They are very, very vulnerable and they were easily exploited. Such were the states of the Gentiles. We were without hope and without God in this world. However, something has changed. Last week we read that those who are dead has been brought alive. This week we read that those who are far away, excluded, separated, now have been brought near. We've been brought near to God and His promises. The walls of divisions have been broken down. The division, the barriers have been removed. We've been brought near by the blood of Christ. It's about Christ and what He has done. Christ here is our peace. See, the word peace is not just what we call a cessation of conflict. It's far more than that in the Old Testament. It means a restoration of relationship. It brings harmony between people. It's not just a ceasefire. It's wholeness and well-being. And here Jesus Christ is personified as our peace. Remember, he was called the Prince of Peace. Christ was our peace, brought his peace by these achievements. Firstly, he has brought, made the two groups one, Jews and Gentiles. The two groups have been brought into mutual relationship and unity with each other, and in doing so, he has accomplished one of the greatest division in the ancient world, the division between the Jews and the Gentiles. Secondly, he has brought a two group one by breaking down the barrier between the Jews and the Gentiles. That's a wall of division we're told between the Jews and Gentiles, and it's due to the Jewish distinctiveness. The Jewish laws uh, contain uh, stipulations there that make them very, very different. They have to observe the food laws, so they kind of eat pork, they kind of eat seafood. They have to obey the Sabbath. They, they, they have to do this and they do that. Well, Christ has broken down this barrier. Dearly, Christ has broken this barrier by abolishing the laws and the commandments in his flesh. While the law was good, it was given by God. The problem with the law was it caused a division between the Jews and the Gentiles. Christ has set aside this law in his death on a cross. The law and their regulation and rules do not apply anymore. When there's no law, there's no longer a dividing wall. There's no, no longer any hostility for those in Christ. Fourthly, the result of destroying the barrier He's creating one humanity out of the two. It's not so much that the Gentiles are now welcome to be Jewish, nor was it somehow the Gentiles were welcome to be assimilated to the, to the Jewish identity. This is not what we call the merger of the equal, where the best bit of the Jewish heritage can combine with the best bit of the Gentile heritage. What Christ has done here, he has created a one new creation, a new humanity called Christian. Many of us who are migrants, I suspect what we call, we struggle with identity as we migrate to Australia. We're not sure what sort of ident our identity is. Is it European? Is it Chinese? Is it Anglo? Is it Indian? It is, you know, we can just go on. Or is our identity predominantly the Anglo-Australian culture here? So some migrants have left the culture behind, embraced the Anglo culture. 
Some migrants have, have what we opt for, what we call a hybrid culture, where they kept the best of both cultures, the Anglo culture and, and the country of origin, be it European, Chinese, Indian. So they keep the best of both worlds and they mix and match differently. So you can see the problem when you unite the Jews and the Gentiles. Should the Gentiles take on Jewish identity? Should we, the Gentiles, take on some Jewishness? So what's the identity of a Gentile Christian? What Christ has done is not to make the Gentile Jewish, nor the Jewish Gentile. What he's done is to create a new humanity called Christian. This is not a hybrid model, nor is it assimilation or the best of both worlds. This is a complete new creation. As Christian, our identity is no longer Anglo or Chinese or Indian or European because those who are in Christ, our central identity is Christian. We are a new creation. And fifthly, as a result, God's work is not just horizontal between humanity, between people, but also vertical upwards between us and God. Nor was it a reconciliation between Jews and Gentiles and people everywhere and creating one humanity, one world. But reconciliation is also between humanity, us, and God, upwards. See, there are two and estrangement, isn't it? There was an estrangement between Jews and Gentiles, but there was a bigger, bigger estrangement between humanity and God. There's two hostility. There's hostility between mankind, Jews and Gentile, but also far, far bigger hostility between man and God. And in the death of Jesus, not only did he put to death the hostility between Jews and Gentiles, but put to death the hostility between man and God. And in this one new creation, one humanity, he reconciled to God. To, through his death on the cross. And that's how we're told he has made peace. As a result of his work, his reconciliating work, we have now have access to the Father by the Spirit. You see that in verse 18. While what he has done was achieved in the past and the focus now is on the present, now we have continuing access to God. We enjoy the benefits of reconciliation. As Gentiles who are far off, we've now been brought near. The consequences are astounding, astounding. Firstly, we're now fellow citizens with God's people. We're no longer alien or foreigner, nor were we somehow second-class citizen in someone else's homeland. We're fellow citizen with God's people. We enjoy the commonwealth of Israel. We belong to the heavenly Jerusalem. We have a homeland. The big sign in heaven is this. We, you are welcome and you are home. Secondly, the imagery moved from political to what we call the intimate family setting. Not only are we citizens and we belong well, we're actually members of God's household. Not only are we citizens of the heavenly Jerusalem, we are, we are children of God's family. We're not just protected by the law of the land. God himself will do the utmost to protect us and give us refuge. When Mary Donaldson, you know the story, married Prince Frederick of Denmark. She immediately got her citizenship in Denmark. She has the right to live in Denmark, protected by Danish laws. But when she married Prince Frederick, she was no longer just a citizen. She's much more than that, that is an, she's now a member of the Danish royal family. Her security was greater. Her protection was stronger. 
Prince Frederick will do all he can to make sure that she was safe. No one could call her a migrant. No one could dare tell her that she does not belong. She is a citizen of Denmark, but more than that, she's the Danish royal family. Friends, such is our status in the Hamley Kingdom. We're not just citizens. Yes, we're citizens, but not just citizens. We are children of the royal family of God. The later imagery moved from the family setting to the temple. Here we're told that we're like living stones being built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Christ as the cornerstone and we're being built a temple in which God lives by his spirit. Not only do we have rights, not only do we have this intimate relationship with God, but now we're integral to the building in which God dwells. We are, we play a significant part in the temple of God. We're not just sort of kept out from the temple like in the past. We are the temple. Last week we learned about the gracious act of God. We who had dead have been made alive and seated with Christ in heaven. But now we read about an unamazing work of Christ. What us was far off, excluded, rejected, despised, refugees. But now we've included. We're citizens. In fact, we're loved as God's royal family and we become integral to his kingdom. Many refugee stories that you read are heartbreaking. Most of them came from what we call war-torn countries. Many of them have witnessed their, their families being killed. And out of desperation, they fled their homes and their lands and their families. And when finally a country like Australia gave them a refugee visa, for them, it's like winning the lottery. They can now settle in peace in a the land. They can have now stability and security. Their kids can go to school. They can work. They, they now truly belong. Friends, that's what God has done for us in Christ. We who are far off has been brought near. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, as we look at this part of our reminded of what you have done in Christ. We who are the foreigners, refugees, you have made us citizens, but more than that, but part of your family. Help us understand the great blessing you bestowed on us in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We will have some question time. Uh, any question at all from what's been said or from the passage itself? Any questions at all? And turn back to Jonathan. Actually, I got a question in here from um, Jesus is our peace because he abolished the law in his flesh in verse 12 by setting aside the law, the flesh, the law with his commandments and righteous. In, in Matthew, do not think I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. How do you understand these conflicting verses? So in, 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 here he said Jesus abolished the law in his flesh. Uh, and in Matthew 5, uh, Jesus said, did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill them. I think we have to understand what the word fulfillment means. Um, for us, most of us, we think uh, fulfillment mean, means um, uh, to, in, in, in the idea of fulfillment, the idea of completion, uh, to make uh, perfect. Uh, so what Jesus has done, he's not come in to somehow 
cause a rack, you know, to destroy all the laws and commandments in the Old Testament. He has come to complete the law and the commandments. All the laws and commandments find fulfillment in Him. He's the one who does the law. The law is all about Him. It points to Him. Once it points to Him and finds its fulfillment in Jesus, He can abolish it, the laws and commandments. So I think that that's how He put the two together. So He's a fulfillment. Uh, all the law and prophets point to Him. Uh, he's the one who did all the law and prophets. He's the meaning of the law and the prophets. Once it fulfilled them, uh, he can abolish the law and the prophets. So I, I think that, 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 that is how it's understood. Any other questions? I'm going to turn, turn back to Jonathan. So we'll now have a time of confessional. The words have come up on the screen and I encourage you to read aloud with me uh, this confessional of our sins. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have gone our own way, not loving you as we ought, nor loving our neighbours as ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed and in what we have failed to do. We deserve your condemnation. Father, forgive us. Help us to love you and our neighbours and to live for your honour and glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Uh, Ian will now lead us in a time of congregational prayer, followed by Angie leading us in song. Good morning. Uh, today we'll be praying for the armed services. Uh, from the prayer book and then for our response to Ephesians. So will you please join me in prayer. Eternal God, the only source of peace, we pray for all those who serve in the defence forces of this land. Give them courage and comfort in all dangers and help us, we pray, to seek for all people the freedom to serve you and each other in peace and justice. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Father God, as Gentiles, we were aliens, without hope, separated from you because of our sin. Thank you for the reconciliation and peace with you because of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, the Prince of Peace. Help us to believe and find our true identity in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and we'll sing together our last song.
now have a few announcements. Uh, firstly, uh, regular Bible study groups are open for new members. If you're not part of one and you'd like to join, please contact David for more details. Uh, now, there's a meeting on Kids Church uh, for the leaders, helpers and interested parents today. And I think we have a video announcement on that one that should pop up on screen shortly. Uh, that's today at 11.40am. Thanks, Pete. Friends, uh, sorry I can't be here to make the announcement in person. Uh, I'm next door in the hall uh, at Kids Church and we're probably in the middle of a segment somewhere uh, so it's a bit hard to, uh, to match the timing. Um, but Kids Church is actually what I want to talk to you about today. Um, at 11.40 today, 11.40 today, so straight after uh, Chinese Church and your uh, morning tea, at uh, 11.40 uh, I'm going to be briefing uh, the all the teachers and helpers of Kids Church that's been uh, serving at Kids Church for the last six months since uh, we come back from lockdown. And I'd like to invite uh, any, uh, any of you who might be interested in teaching or serving at Kids Church to come along and join the briefing as well. It'll be a great chance for you to hear and understand what's been happening at Kids Church in the last six months, uh, but also hear about uh, the plan going forward and consider whether you might be a part of that, um, either regularly or occasionally. Um, a Kids Church, uh, a lot of you probably would not have experienced it. Um, Kids Church is just like adult church. Uh, the children and the teachers, we, we get to uh, pray to God, we get to listen to God's word, we get to hear sermon, we get to sing songs, um, but we also have uh, smaller groups uh, where we're discussing uh, the truth that we heard and reading the Bible for ourselves. Um, so it's almost like uh, church plus Bible study all in one uh, in, that two, in the two hours that the kids are at Kids Church. And not, not, not only that, they also get uh, uh, a bit of fun and play and games, uh, but also they do some cool crafts to help them uh, remember what they've learned. Um, so uh, Kids Church uh, is, a, is, is a great church. It's our third congregation. And um, uh, like any church and like any congregation, uh, we need people uh, to serve in that church, in that congregation. And we do try to teach the kids to do that, uh, but there are certain, certain things that uh, are, left for us, uh, are left for us adults to be responsible for. And a, a big part of that is being teachers and helpers uh, at Kids Church. Uh, but in the new plan uh, coming, coming up uh, in, the, in the plans, uh, there's actually a lot of... Um, things that uh, even if you didn't, didn't feel comfortable being a teacher or helper that you can be part of. Um, so we're actually thinking of launching a new curriculum and that requires uh, a bit of thinking and designing of each of the lessons that we'll, we'll have um, at, at Kids Church. Um, and that, that also means that there'll be a lot of back-end things like uh, maybe using technology so, such as uh, making videos or, or singing songs and recording the songs uh, and uh, designing some worksheets, things like that. Uh, that'll be, um, uh, that'll be uh, that we'll need to do uh, to serve the kids and to teach the children. Um, so that's something that you can be uh, involved in as well. Um, so you don't really have to have your own kids to be part of Kids Church, to serve at Kids Church. And your kids don't have to be in the, in the age bracket of um, you know, uh, preschool to, uh, to year six to, to serve at Kids Church as well. As long as you're willing uh, yeah, to um, love these children and, and serve these children and, and uh, try your best to uh, teach them God's word, uh, then we uh, love to have you come and, and hear the briefing and, and consider and, and join the team as we do that together. Uh, so again, the detail is 11.40. Uh, just in the hall uh, where the kids' church are at. Uh, so 11.40 to about 12.15, there'll be a briefing today. Uh, please come uh, if you, you might be interested. Thank you. Friends, uh, sorry I can't... Uh, and our last announcement for this morning is that we meet, meet here together every Sunday morning. Uh, and you're most welcome to join us here in the building, uh, but we continue to offer the, uh, the online service as well. Uh, as we end the service today, please join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus has brought us together as one family living under you. We pray that with the help of your spirit, our thoughts, words and deeds will reflect this new relationship 
and bring hope to the lost world around us. Amen. A small matter of house cleaning, if you can grab one of the wipes and wipe down your seats before the next service comes in and then just head out through the door on your left. Thank you.